go for those networking events because you never know who you will meet at that point who will be the springboard to the next step in your career. Episode 80. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I am speaking with Tanisha Rafudin, who is the creative director of Concept Culture, which is a creative agency that helps organizations in the built environment grow their businesses and their brand. Now, Tanisha is a trained architect. She's traveled all around the world. She's got a real passion for culture, people, and place. And in this interview, we hear Tanisha's story. It's a very intimate story of how she's carved out her alternate pathway, if you like, for herself in the architectural industry. Um, She talks about how when she first graduated as an architect in around about 2008, the economic recession that was happening globally, how that made it very difficult to find work, and it put her on a different trajectory than what she'd initially anticipated, and she became a sustainability writer for the AJ, um, then a communications consultant at Passive House, and then she eventually found her way back into architecture, and then had that Uh, a revelation, if you like, of discovery that this perhaps wasn't the pathway that she thought it was. And she went back into the communication sides of architecture. And I wanted to share this story because I think it relates and it will resonate for a lot of architects, certainly a lot of architects who I speak to, students who I speak to. I think we forget how broad the world of architecture is and how much there is in terms of opportunity in different career paths and utilizing your different expertise Um, and at university we're not always it's not always crystal clear about that and the structured pathway to become an architect once you're on it we often feel the need that we need to finish it all the way through when in actual fact there may be lots of different opportunities of branches that are coming out of that career pathway and it takes a lot of courage um, to be able to step out of that and allow yourself the freedom to explore what your career could be and what it and what your actual talents really are so um, I really enjoyed speaking with Tanisha and I'm sure that there's going to be I'd love to hear your comments um, about this kind of alternative career path. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Tanisha Rafudin. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible, and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call, or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information, and I look forward to speaking to you. Hello, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Today, I am with Tanisha Rafudin, who is the Creative Director at Concept Culture, Thank you very much for being on the show. Absolute pleasure to be sitting here overlooking the Thames uh, and to speak with you. And you've had a very interesting career, originally as an architect, and now you've moved into what, the work that you're doing at, um, at Concept Culture. So the, my first question is, how did you fall out of love with architecture, and how have you fallen back in love with it? <laughs> Oh, that's 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 <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, just to um, reiterate that, so I, st- I I have had a very unconventional career path, and that is a result of um, 
the first recession, and then secondly, Brexit. So uh, the global economic um, uh, uh, factors around me uh, were quite critical in, in leading my career path. Mm. So it wasn't by choice that I, I, I didn't start off my career as an architect. So I trained as an architect, graduated in the recession like so many others, and was unable to land my first job at, in practice. Uh, but this is around sort of 2008. This is around 2009, 2010. Yeah, so immediately um, the pain was real, the pain was raw. Yeah. In fact, while I was studying, we were seeing all the news, but completely oblivious to what was happening around in the marketplace and in recruitment circles. And so the inability to land my first uh, job as an architect really hit hit hard, it hit hard uh, to me because, you know, I'd done all the right things. I'd done everything that I was told to do growing up. I, I studied hard at school. I was a straight-A student, top of the class. Went to university, picked a STEM subject. Uh, you know, I even worked very hard at, ar at architecture school. Uh, um, and I, and then I went, even went on to do a further master's in sustainable design at a good university. And so I had done all the right things. And yet, I was unable to land that first graduate job. So I, I felt very disillusioned with the whole, with the whole system as a whole. Like I mean, and first starting out, that was your, that was my first reality check with the, with what the world needs and what you're delivering. Can you, you know? give us a, like a bit of an example of the things that you were doing? Because this, this will be something that I'm sure will resonate with many of the listeners who are like looking for jobs or have just graduated. What sorts of things were you doing to find, to go out and look for work? So, well, that was, th that was a time when social media had, had come into play. So um, I was looking for jobs. Um, on LinkedIn, uh, not so much Facebook, but Twitter. I, I was using uh, Twitter a lot, even it, even though it's it, it's it was running slightly different as, as it does now uh, today. Um, looking at the job boards, Reba appointments, um, doing the whole gamut of things. I had a huge spreadsheet of you know hundred practices, uh, and I listed, and each practice had their own job application requirements, and I'd done spent hours building that spreadsheet, and then um, I even mapped out places, and, and so there, I, there was a whole week I spent walking to practices with my CV uh, in, a, in, a cute little, um, in a cute little package, delivering it, hand-delivering it. I went to like Zaha's, Grimshaw's, all the, all the big, big practices, and um, I remember going to Cullinan Studio, and uh, it was a particularly wet and rainy day, and uh, the office manager at the time was so friendly and welcoming. She actually al allowed me to come in and sit down, and you know, and she was like, "Oh, we're 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 not hiring actively at the moment, but we'll keep you on mind." And they called me back as well. I, I did have an interview uh, with them. So yeah, I I I really wanted to be an architect. I I you know I did things. I probably did things that most people wouldn't have bothered mm. doing. Um, and then it reached a point. It was six months down the line. And I was like, I was hitting nowhere uh, and and um, people all around me um, uh, were also hitting nowhere and um, and I, I, and I was like well I can't leave this up to the universe now I have to take control of the situation uh, this is my reality and uh, I need to look at other th other ways I have to be more creative about my of my about my job search um, how else can I get that in, get that foot in the door, this magical foot in the door that everybody talks about, that first step that sets you on your way to your career? And I just wasn't getting that opportunity, thanks to the market factors. And so it so happened on Twitter, I saw this ad from, by the AJ, and they were, uh, they, uh, were running a, a, a sustainability blog called Footprint, and they were looking for an intern to run the blog. And I thought, why not? I mean, I love writing, uh, I love blogs, and I've always thought of, thought of starting my own blog. And I thought, you know, it's for fun. They asked for a 200-word description of why you want to join the blog, and I just, I sent it for fun. And the next day, I got a call back for an interview. Uh, so I went and met uh, the sustainably editor, who's Hattie Hartman, uh, and 
and she gave me the job. And I thought, okay, this this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. And and I had a great time. Uh, I was their first sustainability intern. It was unpaid, of course, but it, this just the the ask the idea that I was in an office finally working, doing something, yeah. and not just constantly sending job applications and getting rejection after rejection. It was that was it was it was just. Uh, life changing yeah. uh, at, at the time, and then it's like a mental relief as mental well. Mental relief, yes, sort of. exactly. Because you know, is this re- you know, ha- we've all been through that. Looking for a job is a thankless. It's it's a thankless thing. You do it day in and day out. It's a full time job in itself, and then getting rejected and rejected and rejected. It takes its toll on on you, and you begin to question mm. yourself and your abilities. And it's this dark hole that you know you just never see the light out of the out of the tunnel and then people all around me were saying no it takes time it does take time to get your first job give yourself 3 months give yourself 6 months uh but i just i just couldn't believe them i i you know cuz i was like yeah you're just saying that to to be nice to me but but i think now looking back it is true you have to give yourself that time because i think there is this sense of entitlement as a fresh graduate that I should land that first job, and exactly how I felt like you know I'd done all the right things, and and still I couldn't get that, that first job. And now it's even tougher. The marketplace is even tougher. There's mm. so many people going to university now. So many more students each batch, and I think it's it's all the more tougher now, ten years later, um, to land that first job. So it is it is very hard, and I feel for students out there now, um, recession or no recession. It is still hard to land your first job, so so I had fun at the at the AJ. I had fun doing the blog, and I realized, okay, that's 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 that that is something I can do. And then I continued to do some more editorial work uh, with the AJ, and I got a publishing gig with Wiley as well. And I worked so I worked on a book on the London 2012 Olympic design. Uh, so that gave me those glimpses of publishing architectural journalism and I thought oh this is cool it'd be fun to be an architecture critic uh and such um but through that network so how long, uh, how long were you doing that so that for? was almost a year a, right. I would say a year uh that 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 process without even realizing yeah so, so this is starting- taking me to the olympics to the time of the Olympics, um, you're starting to gain a quite a, a quite a unique perspective then yes. on the architectural industry absolutely from, from the sort of periphery if you like but also yes. but also being yeah. in it as well. Yeah, and the and that the struggle with that was like I was watching other architects, talking to other architects. Like I would go and interview architects or I would get the press releases and stuff like that. So I'm sitting on the outside watching all of them and I'm just thinking, oh God, I, when am I? When is it going to be me? When is it going to be my turn? And so there was a bit of envy sitting on that side. And uh, I, because I, th- I think that's the other, that's the other thing that, um, uh, I, uh, I, I was constantly fighting with my identity as an architect mm. and the fact that I was doing something else. Like I wasn't practicing architecture and uh, I struggled with that a lot, even though I was working with great people, doing great stuff, you know, creating impact. And uh, not only at the AJ, then my next, uh, next gig was at the Sustainable Development Foundation and they run... Uh, incredible programs like can you, can you say a bit more about that what, what what was the the sort of the internal conversation that was going on well it was um so through uh through my work at the aj i met uh with uh, sophie pelsmakers who's you know the author of the reba book on an environmental pocketbook and uh she then sent me this email saying these guys are looking uh, sustainable development foundation sdf they're looking for a uh, uh, for a comms, uh, for a comms person, a communications uh, um, person, and I said, you know, why not? It's okay, it's okay. And I said, what? You know, why not? I, at this point, I have nothing to lose. And yeah, they called me in for an interview, got that job as well. I took it on, and that was my first paid job, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, um, no, I lie. I know I was I was paid at Wiley. I was paid Wiley, and I did the, some of the work I did with AJ was paid as well. But the my work at the SDF was the first actual um, proper regular paid uh, regular income um, job. And the thought process was my path was clear. I'm going to use this to get into practice. I'm going to use this. That was that was my constant thought process the whole time. Then I'm going to meet people. I'm going to meet other architects through this. 
and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna network my way into my first um, architectural. That was almost always my strategy. So I think that's the other thing. Like I always think in chunks of time, like five years, ten years, and I align my goals in those in those chunks of uh, in those chunks of time. So if I haven't achieved that goal within that chunk of time, I move on and think of a uh, work on another goal. In, in retrospect, now looking back on particularly graduating in the recession when it was very difficult for so many graduates to find work, and you know this, it's not unlikely that that. that is going to happen again, possibly in the not too distant future with the uncertainty that things like Brexit are, are producing. What would you say, would you have done anything differently? Um, looking back, I think uh, what I, I, I probably would say that I should have been more tenacious in my, in my job search and being more aggressive and, and, and grow a thicker skin. Mm. Because that idea of rejection, that this constant rejection really kept bringing me down. And I probably didn't shift as many applications as I, 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 I could have. And I was always, because um, I'm a big believer in, in the universe and the universe's plan for me and, and karma and and stuff like that. And my always my thinking is <laughs> was like, if the universe has a plan for me, it will reveal itself. And um, so I didn't, I didn't work that hard with the recruitment because I was relying on the universe mm. to bring me that first job <laughs> to my doorstep. But that's not how <laughs> the world works. But I, I was, it was quite a, it, it looked like that's quite the romantic version of it. But I was, um, I, I was hope, I was in my head that I was that first wonderful job would land itself on my on my door. But now looking back, uh, job hunting is a numbers game. Yeah. Send those hundreds and two hundreds thousands of CVs out. It, it you know, it's well, like it's like it's, it's, like it's, any, it's yeah. interesting because you're, you're, you're saying that that, and then also then the next strategy that you had was ne was networking. Yep. So I could tell us more about how that was more where that took you. So, so, every, you know, where I am right now is purely networking. It's a hundred percent networking. It's talking to people, meeting the right people at the right time, and then connecting to my next step, and then the, the subsequent step, and so on. So the beauty about working at the AJ, and, and you probably uh, know, uh, experience this as well because you run an, an architecture podcast, is that you meet other architects. The moment you say that you work at the AJ, they want to talk to you. And, and that was incredible, that was empowering. Oh. This is me, a nobody, a fresh graduate, but I have, uh, you know, this little, this little badge that says I work at the AJ, and suddenly they wanted to talk to me. I was like, I need to leverage this. Uh, so I, 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 I talked to, to, you know, so many architects, and because my interest was in sustainable design and environmental design, and I talked to many architects working in that sector, and, and that was the other thing that I, I realized. That was a skill... I couldn't sell, I couldn't market, because people weren't so interested in the fact that I had a master's in sustainable design. It has value today, but back then, nobody cared. I think they would probably be more interested if you could draw a, you know, a door or window scheduling. That's, 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 but, but the fact that I had those skills, where I'd learned how to run those simulation softwares, and there was that crossover between architecture and engineering and this understanding of building physics, somehow it, it didn't translate um, well, and so that was the drumming down I received from from Sophie Pelsmakers actually. So uh, she said that's probably not the best angle to to um, uh, align your job search with, and 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 then um, and then I met. Uh, um, then I, I found the NAWIC network. This is the National Association of Women in, Women in Construction because then I became very aware of this, this idea uh, that there was an inequality in the profession. Again, that was something I wasn't aware of. I hadn't particularly experienced it myself. And through the, I met the chair. And the chair, who's Christina, you know, another just a wonderful person. Like, she took me under her wing gave me a lot of uh, strategic advice, ripped my CV apart, literally tore it into shreds, and 
then I realigned my CV based on her uh, her advice. Um, and through Nawik, I met Morley once. Von well, Stor- what, 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 what kind of things did she? So what, what, what was what was this sort of <laughs> turning inside out of the CV? Because this so is interesting. I think it it the um, uh, f- first of all it was like a uh, now this is a very long time ago so I'm going to try and rack, bring uh, bring rack my memory. Um, but in terms of positioning yourself, and that was where. Um, that was my first um, um, uh, real test of you know creating your own personal brand that your CV is reflects your own personal brand and building that personal brand and 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 marketing yourself uh, as that talent that somebody wants to hire and so it was about communicating what your prospective employer wants to hear not the, what you want to say. So I think that was um, that's the that was the turning point. So then, looking at then the job descriptions in a different light and saying, oh, they're looking for somebody who's skilled in X, Y, and Z. So I need to position the CV based on that. So based on what they need, rather than only what I'm good at. Yes, that will come through. Yeah. But re, you know, it's 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 knowing who your audience is, who's that person who's going to review their C- yeah. your CV and what's going to be most useful and, and to it, them. And this is this is great because this is this is kind of the principles of marketing. It's CV 101. Really. It's marketing 101, CV 101. Nobody teaches you that in school. It's yeah. a real damn shame. And, and and it's it's so interesting actually because I mean I often have lots of students contacting me looking for work on LinkedIn, they're listening to the podcast. Um, I jump on the phone whenever I can and have conversations with people. And I often hear stories of people who have been sending out volumes and volumes of CVs. And it's like something's not working and it's exhausting. And then they'll end up finding themselves in a different type of job or not being able to access the architectural industry. And what you're saying here is this kind of, actually the marketing principles that we talk about with business are the same principles that work with a CV. Absolutely. It's your personal brand, your story, but targeted to the audience that you that that you want to present yourself in front of. So it's not it's not a biopic saying I'm I'm fabulous, hire me. It's like, oh, I hear you need this. This is what I can do for you. Yeah. And this is why or how I will bring value to you, and this is why you should hire me. Yeah. Or this is why we should collaborate. And it's a two way thing, and that's the other thing that um, I realize that it it's um, it's it's a two way process. It's like you interviewing your prospective employer and your employer ex- interviewing you. So when you are looking at the uh, you know your the practices websites, you know there's a lot you can gain from work culture from the website. People don't realize this, but uh, you know when when students are 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 looking for jobs, they're looking at your website. So it's based on what you what you're communicating to them that will you will attract the right talent mm. as well that the students are, are, are you know, even mid career or senior uh, senior positions are looking at your website and and gauging what your company culture is what your ethos is from from your website yeah. so it's all it's all marketing 101 uh, we all have to do it um, we're all doing it all the time. We're, we're constantly marketing ourselves, and now in in, li- in in social media, with the advent of social media, it's just it's so constant. You're constantly publishing. You're on Twitter every time you post. You don't realize you're publishing. You're putting yourself out there. You're opening yourself um, uh, to you know wider opinions or uh, criticism or debate or, or whatever that, that's it. We're constantly publishing all the time, and so that. Building that, building your brand starts from the ground up. It starts from you, what you wear, how you dress, how you talk, how you treat people. Uh, so it's not just about a logo or a font. It's it's very much about you, your personality. It's not just about the design. Yeah, and it's not just <laughs> about the design. It's about you and and your personality. And I think another thing that I realized from my time working in our in architect in in the architecture industry, like. P- they hire the person. That's why that interview process is so important. They're hiring the person and not necessarily always what is on your CV. The CV is the, foot, the first foot into the door. Mm. But at the interview, they really suss you out. Is this person going to fit into our team? We have a tight company culture. You know, we're in each other's faces all the time, 10, 12 hours a day. Are they going to get on with the team? I think that um, that's definitely a critical hiring factor, yeah. and that's not something you can control as a that, as a prospective that, employee. Yeah, yeah. And, and that takes so much out of 
out of the, the sort of personal struggle of it, where it's not actually about you. It's Absolutely. Kind of, it's like there's, there are teams, there's already a, a well-established dynamic. We're trying to see if you can fit in. It's like a relationship. Uh, not every not every date you go on is going to be the right one. There's, Absolutely, it's not going to be the right chemistry every time. Absolutely, and that's and that's and that's the thing. What I what another learning thing, another thing that I um, um, a message I can put out there is that it's not personal. Don't take the job search personally. It is a numbers game. You will eventually be a number. Don't take it personally. Um, they probably are seeing hundreds of CVs, thousands of CVs. So. You, uh, you know, you got to cut them some slack, uh, yeah. some slack as well. But yeah, so we're going back to then, your CV is your the beginning of where you build your your personal brand, and then your social media channels. Especially now, um, employers are looking at what you're putting out there on social media. So uh, I know students who you know have their portfolios on Instagram already, or Behance, or whatever it is. So it's about being creative and and putting your work. Um, putting your work out there and then whether your brand aligns with the brand that you want to work with that's a that's the other thing i think when we start seeing every ourselves as brands then you'll realize oh that fit that didn't work and it's a two-way thing and you can both walk away and you won't take it too personally when, when you say brand what do you mean so because often yeah. often often people will hear the word brand and they will just think oh a logo no, yeah, or, or the tagline. No, but it's it's more. It's than much that. more. But like like I said, uh, uh, like I said earlier, it's 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 everything you do. It's your personality. It's 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 the work you do, the the decisions you make. You know your career choices. Uh, that 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 everything is is as a person you are you are a brand. As a practice you are, you are a brand. The the kind of work that you do. Uh, the staff that you hire, the work culture, um, the way you treat your staff, um, you know, that's all contributes to, to your brand and, and your story. And it's, you know, it, it, it's all about the story these days. You can't run away from it. Yeah. You have to build your story and, peop- and you, it has to be good enough, interesting enough for people to want to hear it. So, so, so going back to your story. Yep. You... You kind of had this transformational experience of your CV. Yeah. Then what? Then you got this this open doors you managed to get. Yes. So so my time at the SDF. So I spent a couple of years um, with them, and then the market began to turn. This is I think 2013, 2014 now. And through the grapevine, I heard that people were hiring again. Architects were hiring again, and. Um, I was like, okay, this is my chance. This maybe this is it. My time has finally come. I'm gonna get that elusive architectural job. So, so, so just so, just so we can recap, as, as a sense of scale, how long was this kind of working in and around architecture, but not being a practicing architect? Um, I think it was five years. Five years. Okay. Five years. Five years. Like, yeah. Now looking back, I think, oh, how did I spend so much time? Uh, away <laughs> but um but so it was it was it was that image um, yeah, after graduating my time at the AJ then my time at the um at the SDF uh purely per, um, doing comms and marketing uh a lot of digital marketing that's that's what I enjoyed content creating content that's what I enjoyed what I realized that I enjoyed the most um and uh, visual content as well, and communicating visually. So I was a self-starter, learned everything from the ground up. Uh, uh, you know, I was, I was, I, I, I didn't have a team, so I was, I was doing everything myself. Um, so I think from the time I graduated to landing my first architectural job, that was a period of, of five years. And it was five years doing a lot of fun work, a lot of, you know, good work. I was, I was enjoying it, I was working with, um, you know, really, uh, really good people doing impactful work. So at the SDF, I worked on programs like the Passive House Trust and the Good Homes Alliance, like really good um, built environment, not-for-profit organizations, um, you know, like um, contributing uh, uh, to the good of the industry. And, um, and it was great. So, you know, like just, just now, like a, a Passive House project has won the Sterling Prize, and and these things don't happen overnight. That's a result of the good work that organizations like the Passive House Trust do, mm. um, putting those messages out there. 
So, um, so I was doing good work, but I was still unhappy. And I couldn't work was out... The un unrequited love. Yes, I couldn't... Of <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And this is exactly like going back to your original question of how falling in and out of love with, uh, with architecture. I was like, I'm, you know, I'm doing this good work. I'm working with good people. I'm around, you know, a good team. And yet I'm not happy. And I'm not finding that career satisfaction that everyone keeps talking about. Uh, and what is it? And I, and I think it was, it was that deep down inside, I, I was losing my connection with architecture. And I wasn't being an architect. And for whatever reason, I built this, this, this idea that I had to be an architect because I studied architecture. It kept me from achieving my full potential in in the jobs I was doing at the time. The thought that you need yeah. to be, right, yes. right. So that held me back. And I wasn't giving 100% to those jobs uh, purely on the basis of, oh, this is just a part-time thing. Right. This is just my Al foot in the Almost door. like it was something was incomplete. Yes, yes, exactly that. Like, um, and almost I felt like an imposter. Like, okay, I'm, I'm not meant to be here. You know, I'm sure there are other people who probably would kill to be where I am right now and doing this work uh, and, uh, uh, you know, trained journalists or trained uh, media uh, uh, creatives. Um, and here I am doing this work and I'm not loving it. Mm. Um, so that, and then it, it reached a head that I was like waking up and I was like, this is not what I was meant to be. And I'm, I'm moving away from my timelines. You know, I was talking about the timelines earlier. I'm moving further, further away. And I feel like if I cross this, t this five years, I will not be able to then go into practice, so I have to act now. And thankfully, the market was turning at that point. I think this is 2013, 2014. And through the Passive House Network, I landed my first architectural job. So it's going back to networks, purely through knowing people and meeting the right people yes. at the right time. Well, this, um, this is interesting. This is the whole topic in, yeah, itse in, in itself, itself about, about, about the, the beauty of building a network and, then, and how and that is like, one of your best marketing assets. Absolutely, absolutely. Being in those places, being in the places where you know the people that you want to meet are going to be there. Go to every event out there. You know, this, just take the time. Yes, it's an evening off. Yeah, you could be out drinking with your friends, but no, go for those networking events because you never know who you will meet at that point who will be the springboard to the next step in your career. So I, I landed my first job um, in architectural practice. Um, so there was it. That was like, is this it? So now, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like high flying in the air. I was like, are you, I can't tell you how happy it, it, I was this, that. I was like, I finally made how many ever years of sitting on the fence, watching it from afar. I was here in practice. <laughs> I have arrived. So, uh, and, and then um, so I worked for a couple of months with them, and then I, uh, then uh, I realized I wasn't so keen on working um, on, on small houses. I wanted to work on larger projects. So then I went and worked with um, a commercial, uh, a small commercial practice. And that was the first time I then used a recruiter. Up until that point, I hadn't used Did you have recruiter. your part three? Did you do your part no, three? No, no, oh. I never, I, 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 I didn't go down uh, down that route. And there's, there's a reason why <laughs> as well. Um, so... Then, uh, so through the recruiter, I landed the landed the the my uh, the uh, the job at a small commercial practice, and that was also the time when I did a whole CV restructure. And so then I because I because I was on the periphery, and uh, you know, and then obviously I was earning a, a certain salary at that time, and then to move back into practice, I had to take a significant cut. Wow, and that was my first re th first reality. I was like, "Okay, this is interesting. <laughs> is this how much they pay?" <laughs> you know? And and uh, this recruiter said, "Like they'll give you the job, but are you willing to go down to you know X Y Z?" And I was like, "Are you serious? Um, mm. You know, living in London, <laughs> the excuse is that is that the is that how much they're paying people?" Um, and then I said, you know what, fine, I'll do it for a bit. It was, it was a contract job anyway, so then I did that. And, but, but what that experience gave me, even at, that, even at the pay cut, was um, it connected me back uh, with drawing. 
So you can imagine at four or five years, I was writing constantly or, you know, doing visuals and creating images and videos and stuff like that. But uh, I wasn't drawing. So that was that harsh reality. And I was like, everyone around me was drawing quickly. And I was just like, you know, just moving the mouse around, getting AutoCAD to work and, you know, that sort of thing, trying to remember mm. um, those basic those basic, uh, basic ways to use uh, a, a 2D or 3D uh, drawing program. And then, and then it's all about Revit. And I hadn't learned Revit, uh, but everyone was saying, oh, yeah, I learned Revit. And the recruiters were telling me, yeah, go get an official Reddit certification and then, you know, you'll magically get that job. And, and I was like, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, we'll see. Again, this is, again, me falling back. If the universe wants to give me a job, it'll give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to go and learn Revit. And and then um, you know taking on this you know advice from people who had shredded my CV apart. I didn't go on to um, place. Is it place? Yeah, place. And I sat down with the director there, and she ripped my CV to, sh- to shred. Yeah, she ripped it to shreds, and I loved her for it. Like I'm totally indebted She's to her really good. To, to de- for ripping that my CV apart and saying this is not what people want to hear. You need to do this, that, and the other. And she and to the point that she's like, you need to go to the um, is it the graphic center and buy this particular portfolio? <laughs> and you know these basic things like you know it, uh, it may seem common sense to people in the know, but uh, to everyone else it, it may not be. But again, that's your brand, the quality of the portfolio that you put your work in. Again, that is you representing your personal brand. If you respect your work enough to buy that fancy portfolio and put your put your drawings in there, uh, that's that's you know that's a good representation uh, of yourself. And I like that. It's, 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 a very, it's a very simple, understated yeah. um, like investment in you. Yeah. It's demonstrating a certain amount of confidence. Yes, absolutely. It's absolutely. You, ha- you have to love your work. Only then will other people love it. Why would they love it if you don't love it, if you don't respect it enough? Um, so, yeah, things like that. There's, there's little small, small <laughs> things that, again, nobody teaches you. You have to learn them the hard way. And so through that, then I landed my first job at, at, a, at, a, at a larger practice, a larger commercial practice. And, uh, and, and that was my real experience with the nitty gritty of architectural practice. So after all those years, I'd finally convinced myself, okay, this is where I belong. Or this is where I thought I belonged. Like, I see you smiling, like, you know where this is going. <laughs> I love and this. I love this. My, ha- I my hairs are standing on end because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and this how, is such a wonderful like, and, and story, how, and I'm sure so many people can yeah, relate to it. And how wrong I was. Well, um, the good, the good was I was finally among my people. <laughs> you know, it's talking like, about architecture. It's like, it's like meeting one of your Hollywood <laughs> stars yeah. or meeting a meeting a, like a, a famous idol or something, yeah. and you're like. Uh, Oh. Yeah, it was, this, is, this is it. So this is the dream. Uh, this was the, the dream of my first year, first day at architecture school, finally, after how many ever years, mm. that you know, tenacity, the resilience that I built through the recession, it's all paid off. And yeah. a lot of people said to me, like, keep going, keep going, don't give it up, keep going, keep going, keep going. And, and, and I didn't want to give it up because, you know, it, I felt like at that point of time, if I had given up without trying then I have failed. Mm. And I don't fail. I don't like the idea of failing. I know this is the st- we are in the startup culture where you have to fail hard, fail fast and everything. And, and it, it, it is relevant to a certain degree, but that aspect of you know, failing at being an architect is something I just couldn't well, deal th- with. This is, this is really interesting because so many of, of the way that be- becoming an architect is sort of structured is in a way where you're not necessarily encouraged to use architecture as a degree or a, a, or as a foundation for other professions or careers or disciplines there is a very structured focused path of like i need to complete it mm. i need to go through it and that in itself is very like once you're in it it's very very hard to ever like leave it oh, okay. and <laughs> you know do you know what i mean yeah like, if, yeah like once once you're on that path you're kind of like and if you leave it at some point there's always going to be this sort of internal gremlin going yeah but you didn't finish that this is unfinished you need to go because sorry there's a pot of gold at the end of it yeah yeah and I think uh, I don't know maybe it was the way I was 
I was trained or it was just um, because I loved the course so much, mm. you know, even though it like it was backbreaking at times and I was spending, you know, doing the all night, all nighters that, you know, we've all done. I loved the course so much and I love love the subject. I, you know, I remember back in university, my, the fa- my favorite subjects were history of architecture, architectural theory and those kind of things. And those were all the signs. I know I didn't read them at the time, but those were the signs that where my love was for architecture. And I didn't enjoy doing working drawings. You know, I didn't, I didn't enjoy drawing pl- 10 mm plas- plaster lines and uh, reflected ceiling plans and, uh, you know, things, things like that. Um, but what I enjoyed was the subject and the theory. Yeah. And even in practice, so, so I mean, let's go dr- back to my experience in actual practice. So that was then my first proper experience dealing with all the RIBA, RIBA stages, you know, from... from zero to practice from start from conception to practical completion so through that experience i touched every stage so i got a glimpse of every stage what goes on what we have to do what we are expected to do uh and that was like then going on site like i i asked to be on site so i went i i shadowed uh the project director i just followed her around on site and you know just seeing the nitty gritties and uh, like seeing seeing nails being you know hidden to the wall and understanding the magic that's where the magic happens on site and that so again that was again me reconnecting with 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 the profession uh but what i didn't like and what i re- was 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 the drawing aspect of it the drawing tender packages, uh, changing dates, changing dates, changing revision numbers, filling out schedules, uh, filling out schedules. Oh my god! Like oh, when you especially when you do like eight, ten story buildings. Well, it is so interesting because you, hundreds and two hundreds of doors and it, windows. Because what what you're explaining is well, you you've, you've just been in a very dynamic environment where mm. you're getting to have an oversee of lots of interesting types of projects. Mm-hmm. You're in an environment where you're conversing with lots of architects. You're yeah. talking to people. Um, and then the actual practice of architecture is a very different set of skills and mm-hmm. also requires, a, I think it's, it's suited for different types of personalities as well. No, you've hit the nail on the head. It is a, it is a personality. Uh, it's, a, it's a certain personality type that can be in an office for eight to ten hours a day. And that wasn't me. Um, and I think a lot, I think yeah. a lot of architects will resonate with that. And I, and I also would say there are lots of different ty- There are lots of different types of offices who don't necessarily practice like that but there is certainly a yeah a certain kind of personality who likes the quiet solitude of detailed drawings and there is a lot of fulfillment in that Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong there's a lot that that is that is a very interesting thing to be engaged in and remember you have um as i transitioned from a fast-paced uh um environment where you write a blog and you publish it it's out there the world reads it uh, you write a, write a book, it's out there, the world reads it, the world, world buys it, and the turnaround is like days, weeks, months. Yeah. Uh, at, the, at, the very, um, at the very most. Social media, it's the turnaround's instant. You get, you, know, you, get, you get the result, you see it, you get either the praise or the criticism, whatever it is. But buildings, oh my God, <laughs> they take so long. <laughs> and that's another thing they don't tell you at architecture school. And... And I was like on a project for like a good three years, the same project, the same project. And I know people who've been on projects even longer, the same project. Well, I, I, when I was working at RSHP, they had the Leadenhall building was in the office for 18 years. Yeah. Terminal 5, 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. like, that can be a, that can be a career. Yeah, 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 on exactly. One, on one, on it's one an adult. It's the growth <laughs> of an adult. You know, it's, it's that, that scale. And I think uh, the... So it was that, like, so it was my impatience, like, why is it taking so long? Like, you know, from stage one to stage seven or eight or whatever, it's just taking so long. And then sometimes uh, projects are put on hold, then you're on the bench, and then you're reassigned, and, you know, all those things that happen in large practices, like, you know, you're a floater for some time, (laughs) and, you know, and then you're back on your on your project, and then you know when they when you reach a certain level of confidence, then they assign you a project, and then you have that, and that's your baby, and uh, and then you really and and you connect with it, and then and they take it, it, then they take it and away, and then they take you. it away, <laughs> and then they take it away, and they give it to someone else, and you know, <laughs> you're like what? <laughs> uh, so all I saw, I experienced a lot of the ins and outs of uh, being in a large practice, working with 
multiple teams, working with diverse teams, coordinating with um, engineers and consultants and, and, and working directly with clients. That's what I love the most, mm. like talking to clients and listening to them, uh, hearing what they need and, and what they want. And, and, and those, like, those people connections and, and, and going out. And then again, you know, I come from a strong networking background. I have barely found the time to network. And nor did I see anyone around me who wanted to network. Like, oh, there's an event, let's go. No, there was no aptitude or, you know, for it. Like, um, it, that really surprised me uh, that, that, that there was not much of an interest in going out there, seeing what other people are doing, connecting with mm. other people. Um, so all those, um, you know, I was missing all the things that I actually enjoyed being a marketing and comms professional. Um, and that wasn't translating into being an architectural professional. So, so now then five years later, so now I've been 10 years working and Brexit happens. So this is the, this is the next uh, turning point in the story. Redundancies. That was my first experience with redundancies. So you get this email. We're going to do a round of redundancies. And then you're like, and I'm like, oh no, not this again. <laughs> you know, um, I don't, like you know, it worked so hard through another recession, and now here I am again. Um, uh, you know, and it it's all, can all go come crashing down. And but um, the lessons I'd learned from the first recession is, stood by me. So I was very strong. I was very resilient. And I was like, okay, if it happens, it happens. If it's me, you know, I, you know, I'll just m move on with my life. I'm not going to take it personally, and such, such and such. But redundancies, however fair they may seem, it's an ugly business. Mm. Um, and it affects morale throughout the, throughout the practice. And you're just sitting there wondering, are you next? And it's just a very, very, very ugly, ugly, ugly business. And then I was like, okay, so I've hit my now my 10 goal, 10 year mark. What have I achieved? You know, where, I'm, where am I going with this? Like, okay, I've done it now. Um, and am I happy at the end of the day? Is this, was this what I want? You know, all, mm. you know, all those years uh, has culminated to this point, this marker. And I had to honestly ask myself, was I happy? And the answer was no, I wasn't. Because it wasn't fulfilling me in the way that I had expected it <laughs> to fulfill. So I had to manage my own expectations. Okay, this is the reality of practice. And I'm not loving it. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do next? And, and, and that was actually a convenient time when, when work was drying up. There were a lot of days I was doing nothing. Uh, still getting paid, so that was amazing. But That's always good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, my career was stalling. I wasn't learning. I wasn't growing. And, uh, and I was like, okay, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, time. it's time for the next big step. And one thing I haven't talk, touched upon is my, my love for adventure and travel. And that's also a reason why I became an architect, because somehow, somewhere, I thought that I would uh, travel the world, visiting beautiful buildings and places and learning about different cultures. And, and the reality was that no, architecture didn't give me that. I had to work. I had to. You know, <laughs> I had to, I had to um, it, well, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Cause it's, it's one of these, it's one of the romances that we get yeah. from our education. Because cause you do, you get this kind of really unique, wonderful glimpse into the richness of the world of architecture. And as a student, you might go on these incredible trips where you're going to like Norway or Tokyo or Hong Kong. Absolutely, or, yeah. Or like you know, Sao Paulo, or just these like, fabulous destinations and, you, yep. and you're getting like this unique perspective where you're visiting all sorts of buildings and culture and it's just like, yes, yeah. this is what an architect is like. Absolutely. That glamorous side that they show you, like this is what you could be building, this is what you could be creating. Your name will be on the door someday. Uh, no. And <laughs> I mean, yes, some people get there, but not everybody does. And it's, I think it's like the, the other closest analogy I could Maybe B is like making it in Hollywood, for example. Not everyone gets to be um, an ac Academy Award winning architect or a Prisker Prize winning architect. So that's again managing your own expectations and realizing that not everyone is going to make it. So, and you have to be fine with that. Like, yeah, yeah. and, and, and you know, the, the reality of working in an architect's office in the UK, it's unlikely that you're going to have lots of opportunities to be 
you know, traveling. Mm. Or I mean, some some offices will. Some places, yeah. some places, you might get the opportunity to do that. Yeah. But it's not like a kind of a standard thing where you're always traveling and yeah. seeing. But as an architect, that's a skill that you can bring to your own. Yeah. Adventures. And it's a real shame because you know you learn a lot about architecture from visiting yeah. good buildings and visiting those fantastic cities and visiting those places, seeing how people are engaging with buildings, seeing how people are reacting to buildings. And I think that's another thing that we. Um, I felt that was missing because we're we're so focused on the design and how magnanimous the space is, how magnificent the facade is, all those materials. But at the heart of it, it's how people experience the space that's more important and more valuable to them. And that's the value that you bring as an architect to mm. cities and towns and, and, and such. So it was a real shame that uh, that didn't transpire. And then and I was like, but I want to travel the world. Um, but I can't carve out the time, you know, in full-time employment on 25 days, holiday a year. It's it's physically impossible to 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 travel the world. And I I, I became uh, obsessed with following people, travel influencers on Instagram. And I was constantly looking at what they were doing, and you know, um, and such and such. And then I became I also became part of this movement that I want to visit every country in the world. Um, that just took hold of me, but it was time and money, and you know it's a it's a huge lifestyle shift uh, versus uh, you know then your career goals and your career ambitions, and also you know as you grow older, your your priorities in life change. Like you know probably at at uh, you know as a twenty year old you could work ten twelve hours a, a day and and don't think twice about it and that's okay and you have fun and you know it's all part of the uh, learning curve um, but as you grow older it's not fun anymore mm. uh, to work 10 12 hours a day and then the bigger picture is if you start thinking about a family and then within practice I was looking at people you know all, all the people who were parents um, and you know then the long hours culture and I'm just thinking when do you spend time with your children do your children ever see you and and that was the other turning point. That's like, I don't want to be uh, that person. Like, if I do uh, end up growing a family, I do want to spend time uh, with with my family, and uh, you know, I would like to do that well. And I just felt like in the current state of practice, it must be difficult. It can't be easy uh, to run a family and be uh, a committed uh, committed architect. So there's all those multiple factors going on in my mind, and I was like, you know, it was the big thing, quit your job, travel the world, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. Everyone's doing it. I'm going to do it. You know what, let's see, let's see what happens. And, uh, and so I began planning my exit strategy. So that was almost a year in planning, because I'm a meticulous planner. I plan ahead. And, you know, they say humans make plans, and the universe laughs. That's happened to me yeah. <laughs> uh, many a time. But... Um, the the round, planning my first round the world trip then gave me immense energy and my goal was to visit every continent um, it didn't it didn't so transpire uh, I still have to visit Antarctica but <laughs> but I will I will I definitely will and so um, so I had planned that so I taken decided to take six months off and that was like going to be my sabbatical or my uh, it's my time, time for myself, time to reflect, um, and solo traveling. That's something I hadn't done before, and uh, I wanted to do it by myself, for myself. I mean, I like, spent how many years always around people, like, yeah. you know, around either our family, around friends, around my partner, and never spent any time just by myself. So, it, so I had to do it for, uh, for myself, and there were it. I was on the cusp of the next point of my career, so I needed the time and the headspace. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience traveling by myself. It was incredible. I felt invincible. When I came back, I was like, I've done this. I can do anything. So that was that sense of, I had that sense of empowerment. That, yeah, I, yeah. Could, I could do anything. And, you, and you've kind of had your completion with architecture. Yeah, well, I wouldn't oh. say that. I wouldn't say that. The story with architecture hasn't quite well, finished how did, yet. <laughs> well, how did you fall back in love? So, uh, so there, was, there was the out of love, the yeah, in love, the out, out yeah, of love. Yeah, I'm now falling back in love. So, and now, uh, and now yeah, the new relationship. And the new relationship. So um, I, uh, when I came back, I was like, okay, I need to now um, regroup, reflect, 
Um, and I thought maybe I'll, I'll send some job applications out. Let me just see see what happens. And I um, put my por portfolio together, uh, spoke to recruiters, even went on a few interviews. Uh, but the interview stage was when I realized it's it's not going to work out anymore. Like the at, at, when I was talking to people, it was that internal thing. Like, yeah, no, I'm not feeling it. I I don't think I can go back. Too much has happened. I've I've learned too much. Uh, I've grown as a person. Uh, I've reconnected with my my own values, my own personal values. Um, and I decided I have to make a a huge change, change in mindset, change in lifestyle. Um, did a lot of self-learning, read a lot of books, like The Art of Work, uh, for example, that was a very good book. Uh, um, Michelle Obama's biography, you know, that, those, those becoming. sort of things. Yeah, becoming. Uh, and just uh, hearing people's stories, like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, there's, there's you know, they were ordinary people once, and now they've they've they're now in places of prominence. And how do they do it? So just do, doing a lot of the reading, soul searching, um, then just reflecting on my career. I went back and spoke to uh, all the people I worked with, all of my former clients, uh, former ment former mentors, even current mentors, and um, um, pulling out what I was good at and drawing and visualizing what I was good at, what were my market marketable skills were, and what I wanted to do. So uh, so I, I, I'm still in love with architecture, I realize that. I'm, love, I'm in love with the storytelling aspect of architecture. Mm. I'm in love with the way architecture connects with people and how it impacts people's lives and how it improves people's lives. But I'm not necessarily in love with the construction side of it. And I think I made that, made peace with that. Um, and I found closure. And I think that's <laughs> the moral of the story. Finding that closure and find, and making peace with the fact that uh, I didn't fail. Yeah. You know, I, I, d I tried. And I tried hard to make it work as well. Like, I, 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 I really did. Um, but it just, the uh, realities of practice just didn't align with my, with my, life choices um, and personal goals. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it's such, a <clears throat> it's such an interesting story and I, I know so many architects who maybe they're going through something like this or have found themselves in, inside of a, a job practicing as an architect and perhaps it's not fulfilling or it's not what they expected. And the danger is that that just continues for 20, yeah. 30, 40 years. And yeah. then and that's, you know, and then that, can, but for other people, obviously, it is it's fantastic and they love it. And there's not there's not a right or a wrong here, and there's no one job is better than another. No, no. But it's much more like you being truthful to yeah. what's going on for you. Absolutely. And that's why I love the, love your story yeah. because you've kind of and you very candidly, op you know, shared the process of that. Yeah. And so now it's resulted in. Tell us a little bit about just to finish up on this. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about on your new venture of, of concept culture, what you're doing. Right. So, so when I realized how, that, I, and how this kind of love of architecture is now manifested yeah, in, in your new venture. Absolutely. So, what I realized was in my ten career of ten years is that I love the visual communication aspect of it. I love creating content. I love marketing. I love branding. And I love architecture. And I somehow had to marry that together. And I don't know, I, I, is there a job out there that exists where I can do both? I, you know, that was the answer I had to find. And uh, then, I, um, then I realized that maybe there wasn't. And I had to create my own, uh, create my own job, create this, this, this new dream, this new job, which which allows me to explore um, the things that I love to do and my passion for, for architecture and aligns with, um, with my new life goals, which were effectively location independence because I still want to travel to every country <laughs> in the world. And uh, so I need to be able to work remotely. And, you know, as you and I know, it's, it's not possible to work in architecture remotely all the time. It's very much a a job that you need to be there uh, in the office or on site and stuff. So, it, again, making my peace <laughs> with that. And so what could I do remotely? 
what can I do purely on a laptop with the internet? And that then informed my decision making. And um, so one of my former clients uh, said, oh, I have this, I have a little um, a job. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bid, I have a little uh, job I need to do quickly. Uh, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And so I did that and I was like, okay, this is, this is cool, I'm feeling it, I'm feeling this. And I was like, maybe that's, that's the aspect, that's, that's, that's where I want to go. I want to start um, building, uh, building a, a little um, organization of people um, who work in communicating architecture, com communicating the value of architecture. And uh, so I then started connecting with other creatives and um, I, some people I met while I was traveling. Uh, you know, I I I look look at people online, look at their portfolio online, and and just connected with these people. And I was like, look, I'm 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 thinking of of, of setting up setting uh, setting up a little venture. Uh, would you like to collaborate? And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, if there's work, we'll do it. And so then I had to now then I was starting to start building my building the brand of my next the next step of my career and that's how concept culture was born it's bringing together uh, a love of architecture a very very deep love for of architecture with with a love for um, visual communication marketing branding and the storytelling aspect uh, of architecture but not related to architecture alone built environment uh, as a whole, so uh, my current pool of clients uh, form part of the wider built environment um, uh, sector, and um, so um, my current current goal is to build a team of uh, very talented creatives uh, to help architects and built environment professionals uh, tell their stories, uh, meet online or in print. Um, we're very new, we're very young. You, you could say we're a startup, uh, but we're less than a year old, but we've already um, built brands from scratch. Yeah. We've built websites. Uh, we've run promotional campaigns. One has proved so successful that the supply chain couldn't even meet the demand. And that was like, that was a brilliant, uh, brilliant sense of achievement. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, uh, created videos. Uh, I've even worked with TV presenters like Charlie Luxon, for example. Uh, so it's a whole gamut of things now that I'm able to do out of choice. So I choose, uh, choose the work that I want to do. I choose the people who I want to work with, and together we deliver um, uh, valuable solutions for uh, for our clients. So it's it's been. Uh, hell of a journey so far and to top that I've been able to align my personal goals so I, I was able to travel to two to ten new countries this year amazing I spent three weeks in Mexico learning Spanish so now I can speak Spanish so it, it's it was it was a hard grind but I have found that balance um, doing the work that I want to do uh, and aligning it with the lifestyle that I want want to live and working with the people who I want to work with. And I want to help my clients do that as well. Like, I found a way to do it, and I want to help other people uh, do that as well. And the, one of the first steps is building the right brand for you, marketing yourself to the right people, marketing yourself to the people that you want to reach. I think that's the... That how do you reach the people mm. that you want to reach? And it's, uh, you know, it's not that, uh, it's not that straightforward. Um, so... So here I'm here now, um, balancing both uh, both skill sets, my knowledge of the architectural and construction industry with my knowledge of branding and comms and marketing, uh, and pulling it together uh, to deliver unique solutions under concept culture. I love it. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's a perfect. Thank I you. think that's a perfect place to, to end up. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment 
except to help you be unstoppable.